if, if, if I can, if it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, because it is quite clearly specified that that uh, that part of Radharani's mood, Radha's behalf, that Goranga is experiencing. Uh, in context of Puri Lila, in Gambira Lila, and like that, is very exclusively the, the, the Vipralamba Bahama. So, in that context, uh, is the understanding that in the context of Navadvip Lila, it's more like uh, still Radha's mood, Radha's bath, but, but in, uh, uh, in uh, Milan or some book, some book conception. When he's, uh, I mean, in, in the kirtan with uh, at Shriva Sangan and and public kirtans late later. Navadvip Dham is also a place of separation, but it's not as intense, and it's not as focused. Although sometimes Mayapur Dham is described as a place of Radharani. And it is, but we can see if we analyze, just like Vrindavan is a place also of Radha, but in Vrindavan there's also exchanges with Yashoda and with the cowherd boys and with many different things. And in Jagannath Puri, it's exclusively Radha. Mahaprabhu is, is completely fixed on that in the Gambira. Whereas in Navadweep and Mayapur, Mahaprabhu is Nimai Pandit. And he's married, he's reciprocating with his wives, he's a nice son, he reciprocates with his mother, he has his students, he, he's, he has so many different relationships that he's, that he's focusing on. But in Jagannath Puri, after he takes sannyas, he's just completely focused on tasting the mood of Srimati Radharani. What brought me to that, to that question is that there is this conception understanding of the specifically kirtans at Shiva's Angan that they represent the, the Rasa Lila in, in Raja Lila. Mm -hmm. So that would be like clearly clearly so I, I've spoke some about this before. I actually we spoke about this from so many years about Puri. And sometimes I I have to I, I mistakenly think oh why don't devotees just get it right away. But then I, being with Krishna Kuhn is, is quite perceptive. You, you've seen that. And uh, she's been hearing for so long. But I remember after she'd heard our presentation about uh, for Lita Madhav about, I don't know, the fifth or sixth time or something, she kind of said, oh yeah, now I've got it. <laughs> it. It takes some time to think about things. And partly because we hear things just like we've all experienced, I think, especially if you, if you enter into that, that, uh, the realm of that strange place called Facebook, where people uh, get angry with you for no reason or something. Or maybe your wife or your husband gets upset with you for seemingly no reason. And what did I do? What did I say? Sometimes we hear something, we think we're hearing something from somebody. If somebody, for example, if somebody comes to talk to you about Lady Diksha Gurus or something controversial, then most devotees have already got a conception about that topic. And I'm not going to talk about that subject, but they've already got a conception. And if you start to say something, then immediately they're, they're trying to figure out, are you a friend or you're an enemy? Are you on the good side, whatever conception I have, or are you on the bad side? And, some, and then they put you in this little box and they just start shooting at you with all this information. And you might not fit in their box because actually there's a lot of different conceptions about that subject. But sometimes we're, especially warriors, people who want to fight, there's so much, they have their conception. You either agree with them or you're like an enemy. And if you're an enemy, then they try to figure out what kind of enemy you are and they just start shooting their, their ammunition at you and sometimes they're not shooting the right ammunition at all. So, in a similar way, we, we perceive the world through the lens of our consciousness, and we perceive Krishna consciousness like that. We perceive the Dham. And it, it's something very subtle. 
it's, it's oftentimes not conscious, but we already have a conception about Vrindavan, about Puri, about Kirtan, about deity worship, about so many things. And if somebody comes and says something which doesn't fit in our conception, sometimes we just can't really hear it. We don't really understand it, and we just kind of goes over our head. Or other times we, we misunderstand it, and all oh, this person's wrong, and I should fight with them, and this is that. <laughs> so, like that. So, so Jagannath Puri Dham is understood by so many different people in so many different ways. My happiness that I've had over the years with this Dham is to try to understand it through the conception that I've heard from my Gurmaj and from Fakir Mohan Prabhu and the direction that they pointed me, uh, not just a, a, a kind of static, uh, linear kind of thing, but they, they pointed in a certain direction. And we've gone in that direction through literature and through speaking with different sadhus and things. And we found more things to, that have expanded and supported their concepts. Is that okay? Is that helpful? <laughs> Yes, yes, one, then one, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's saying everything, but like, <laughs> that, um, maybe that's why we ask the questions so that, that we can get our, our nourishment as you got from your Guru Janas, then, then we, we want to get. <laughs> well, that's we, why there's three types of discussions, Vada, Jalp, and Vitanda. And when we say that, we're not just speaking in an angry way about Facebook discussions or something. Uh, Krishna Kund, we have a phone call. Uh, but we're, uh, I don't know, we can cancel it or whatever you want to do. Uh, but Madhvacharya has written a whole book about these, this subject matter. And uh, he explains that we want to, he to hear in a sattvic way. Mm -hmm. But most, most that's a Vada discussion. A Vada discussion, you've heard me speak about this. Both participants just want to know the truth. But in, in a jalpa of the discussion, in the mode of passion, there's already a conception. And one point that we haven't often made in that dis in talking about these types of discussions is because there's already a conception, they're not able to hear. They're not ready to hear and they're just fixed on their conception, and they're really not interested in hearing. And if you turn to discussion, they just want to fight. <laughs> and they, you know, they feel like, you, you're going to destroy the whole movement if you have like this, and we have to come, we, we have to, you know, argue about it in this way or that. But if I'm thinking about it, uh, because either you, you would have the uh, advantage, in a, in a sense, if you would be like a blank sheet of paper, you know, like just brand new devotee, and then you come into the association of of, of the devotees of Guru Janas that, that you very easily may develop faith in, and then you can hear, and your your, your cup is getting filled with with a specific uh, conception. But what about the devotees? Who we are more or less, uh, we carry the, the conceptions and most, uh, not, not mostly, but many times they might be even misconceptions. And, and then, then, then we still want to learn this art of Vada approach and have the proper attitude for, for that level so that still we can be filled with the, with the with proper conceptions. So, so, so that that might be a little like you know, it's very easy to 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 imagine it when you are just, as I said, blank sheet of paper. But if you already carry the the conceptions and misconceptions, then then it requires like as a great amount of faith in the person, and and uh, yeah, we are something who who really can for you. For, for yourself stick out of the crowd in the, in the sense of the ability of that Vaishnava to touch your heart, to, to enter into your heart with, with his Bhagavad Gata, with his Krishna 
Hakatan like that. Because otherwise, otherwise you will always, uh, you, uh, if you will be presented with some other conceptions and there will not be this, this set up this situation with like full faith to, to that Vaishnava and, and, and uh, let's say closer relationship, then, then you will always have a tendency to consider conceptions that you are faced with, with your already, the conceptions that you already carry with you. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jiva Goswami speaks about this in Bhakti Sundarbha because the first thing when we speak about uh, Navavidhi Bhakti, the, the nine processes of Bhakti, the first is Shravan, first is hearing. And we spoke at length about that, you've heard us, about Shravan Adhikar, the qualification to hear. And Jiva Goswami also speaks about that quite a lot in Bhakti Sundarbha. And he says there that uh, why is it, he raises a question, that why is it that some people, they're attracted to bogus gurus, bogus philosophies, bogus ideas and things, and somebody else is attracted to something nice. And he quotes a verse from Brahma Vivarta Purana, two verses, that speak about because of the sin or uh, offenses in someone's heart, They'll, they'll, they have a certain kind of conception. So that's there. And as, as you're mentioning also, it depends on, on the shraddha, the, the quality of faith someone has. If someone is very, very simple and they have some faith in you, then they can hear. If someone doesn't have faith, it may be hard to... Please sit down, Prabhu. We're getting a few other devotees here and there. Sorry? Oh, the AC will kill you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> There's a couple little chairs over there. It's very, very important in Vaishnavism to consider who we want to hear from. And this is a controversial subject. If you speak to a lot of the devotees who've left ISKCON, for example, and gone to Gaudiya Mutt, they, they speak about this quite a lot, because that's their realization. Because they were hearing from persons that, that didn't inspire them for some time. And then they, they met some Maharaj or whatever who did inspire them. And then they started hearing the proper science about hearing, and they understood, oh, I need to hear from someone who's a very elevated Vaishnava. Because if we hear from someone who's not such a personality, and this has to do with all of us also, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, uh, we may pick up subtle misunderstandings from them. So at that point, then, then we may say, okay, fine, I'm not giving class. And I forget it. <laughs> I'm not a qualified person. And my grandma spoke like that too. He said, you're not qualified. I, once I, 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 you've probably heard me tell this story, I'm sorry. But once I, I I'd, uh, met my grandma in the airport in Kolkata, and he was flying to Australia, and I was also flying out, but I was going to Malaysia. And I had uh, a, a problem, a dilemma. And at one point, Guru is alone, and I approached him, I said, Guru Maharaj, I, I'm afraid to go to Malaysia. And he said, don't be afraid, Vaishnava is never afraid. And I said, well, Guru Maharaj, the, the problem is they asked me to give class a lot, like two or three times a day, like every day, like every Bhagavatam class for one or two months in a row, every Sunday feast lecture. It wasn't a lot of devotees in that temple to give class. And they just really, somehow they liked my classes. And they would ask me to give class a lot. And Guru Maharaj said, so you speak. And I said, but Guru Maharaj, what's the benefit? And he said, I'm a conditioned soul. And I speak like that, and then I'm just going to become proud. And what real benefit are those persons going to get? And then Guru Maharaj, <laughs> he kind of leaned back in his chair and looked at me again kind of nodded his head, like, oh, this is, he liked what I said. And then he told me, he said, if someone asks you to speak, 
you must. Mm -hmm. You have no other choice. <laughs> he said, but when you speak, you just repeat what you've heard from your guru and the previous acharyas. And then he took and jammed his finger really hard in my chest. <laughs> and he said, don't think it belongs to you. So that was a very beautiful exchange. I, I'm sorry, Leela. Yeah, I know you've heard me tell that story probably a hundred times or something over the years, but uh, it was a very important time for me. And, and philosophically, I think within that exchange there's a lot of very important points that naturally as a, as a neophyte devotee, we, we don't feel qualified and we're not qualified. But if we just repeat what we've heard and we don't think it belongs to us, then there's benefit. And, and as you've probably heard me comment before, that it is, as long as we repeat that, we've seen amazing things. Like you, you go and, and you talk to people, you say, you know, you're not your body, and we're conscious living entities, and this, and you, and you start speaking some of Prabhupada's philosophy, the, the philosophy from Prabhupada's books, people say, wow, that's amazing, oh my God, and, and they want to come to the temple, they want to become devotees. And should we think, yep, it's because of me. I'm such an advantage. And it's not because of us. It's because we repeated what we heard from Srila Prabhupada. And that, as we've commented quite often, that's the function of the disciple, to repeat what we've heard from Gurudev. But at the same time, we should be honest and, and, and recognize our limitations and if there's some advanced Vaishnav, truly advanced Vaishnav, then we should encourage devotees to go in here or there, and we should go ourselves. And we've seen this as a problem also in our society. Some devotees heard from Srila Prabhupada. And then after Prabhupada left, they said, anyway, I, I don't need to hear from anybody. I've heard from Prabhupada. Maybe, if you're, if you're a very advanced Vaishnav, but if you're not so advanced, then maybe some mistakes might be there. And we've seen that. That's the history of our movement. I don't, I'm not trying to, to say anything negative. It's just an, a, an obvious history. And because of that, some devotees have been become discouraged and gone elsewhere. So we should understand this philosophy and we should uh, be careful who we want to hear from. But that hearing, again, as Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj says in a very beautiful way, that we, Narutam Das Thakur says that, that uh, Sadhu Shastra Guru Vakya Chiteti Kodiya Aikya. We'll be hearing it from, from Prem Bhakti Chandrika about this in upcoming sessions. So he, he speaks, and I often quote this again. He, th this is in a sequence. The first we hear from Sadhu. But who is Sadhu? Sadhu is someone who speaks Shastra. And to the extent that he speaks Shastra, he's a Sadhu. And maybe he just, he said, I don't know any verses, but I know Krishna's God. And you should chant God's names. That's also hearing. And, and that can help, depending on how, convicts, how much conviction he has. But if they can quote Shastra, Chaitanya Chaitanya says that devotee is a better devotee. Mm -hmm. So, Sadhu, Shastra, and then Guru. And then by, by hearing from sadhu and hearing and understanding shastra, then we can come to understand what is guru and how, who, who guru is and how we should come to guru. So all these things are, are there when we talk about Jagannath Puri. And different devotees, different Vaishnavas will have different conceptions. Uh, as we were mentioning uh, with you, I'm going to just speak a little bit about this for the devotees in general here. Uh, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur in his commentary, his Sartha Darshani commentary on the 46th and 47th chapters of the 10th canto, he presents a very interesting conception. And that is that within Vrindavan there are two compartments. A compartment of union and a compartment of separation. And they're both going on at the same time. Now that's a really far out idea for a lot of devotees. And Prabhupada doesn't speak about that as far as I know anywhere. Jiva Goswami also speaks something about that. And Sanatana Goswami in kind of a backhanded way as does Rupa Goswami too. But Vishwanath and Jiva directly speak about that. And, and Vishwanath gives some examples. He, first of all, he says that when Krishna 
left Mathura to return to Vrindavan. When Nanda Maharaj returned to Vrindavan, he wanted Krishna to come with him. And Krishna, when he left Vrindavan, he promised, in the Bhagavatam he uses the word ayasya. Ayasya means I'm going to return. He promised the bridge bosses I'm going to return. So Krishna wanted to return. According to Jiva Goswami and Gopal Champu, Krishna stayed, we know, in Mathura. And Nanda Maharaj came by himself. But according to, to Jiva Goswami, Krishna expanded himself. And two Krishnas were there. And one Krishna stayed in Mathura. Another Krishna returned with Nanda Maharaj. And then he expanded Nanda Maharaj and all the boys. So there were two forms of Nanda Maharaj and the boys. One group returned to Vrindavan with Krishna and Balaram. Another returned to Vrindavan without Krishna and Balaram. And so one of them went to the compartment of union, where Krishna is always present. And we were speaking of this yesterday, Vrindavana Parityagar Padikam Nagachati, that Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. This is one of the answers, how Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. And there's a number of different ways our acharyas have dealt with this subject, very interesting topic. I've mentioned yesterday, this is a, we give a seminar about this, and I think it's at least four different explanations of how Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. So Vishwanath, he says that, he gives the example of Uddhava. When Uddhava was coming to Vrindavan, initially he saw, he entered into the, un, the, the, the chamber of union. And he saw everyone was so happy and everything was so wonderful. And he saw the cows and, and the, the deer and all the animals were dancing and all the people were happy. And then he went a little further and Vishnu says, and he came to a chamber of separation. And he found everyone was crying. I wrote an article a few years ago. It was more of a translation from that purport, as well as some things from Narahari Chakravarti's Narottam Vilas, with a few comments from myself. And in Narottam Vilas, he mentions how Narottam Das Thakur, when he first went to Navadweep, when he arrived there, he saw everyone was doing kirtan. Every house they were doing kirtan. Everybody was in ecstasy. And it was the most amazing place he'd ever been before. This is after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had left this world. So when he first arrived in Navadweep, he saw he had this amazing vision. And then he went a little further, and all of a sudden he saw something very different. That everybody was crying and very disturbed and no one there was like a, a ghost town nobody wanted nobody's moving around in the streets or anything and then he met someone and when that person saw him he started crying oh you're a devotee of Mahaprabhu he recognized Narottam as being a great devotee and embraced him and uh, he then he so he entered into a chamber of union and then he entered in the chamber of separation so that this is a very very deep concept that our Goswamis have given and let's, uh, in this session tonight, maybe we can analyze a little bit about this, this conception. What was the purpose of it? What is the, the novelty of it that our Goswamis have done? I, to my knowledge, actually, to my knowledge, there was some discussion like this in Vaishnava literature before the time of the six Goswamis. According to our teacher, Fakir Mohan Prabhu, this little picture behind my head, uh, prior to the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in Odia literature, they were writing about Radha and Krishna and so many things, and there was some conception about this Nava Vrindavan, about this place which in Puri, which is Vrindavan, but it's not Vrindavan. That's, that's Lalita Madhav, we were speaking about earlier. That's also Brihad Bhagavatamrita. It's also mentioned in Ujjal Nilamani. It's also mentioned in Raghunath Das Goswami's Mukta Charit. Not so elaborately, mostly elaborate in Lita Madhav and Brihad Bhagavatamrita. But it's mentioned in different places. So th that's one thing they've done. They've talked about another Vrindavan, a place in Dwarka, which is Vrindavan. And in fact, without going in depth with this, some of the devotees here have heard the Lita Madhav at least. The conclusion of the Lita Madhav is that Krishna never left Vrindavan. 
and his leaving and his going to Dwarka and getting married to Rukmini and all these queens and things, that was just a dream. But he never left Vrindavan. So that's a conception that our Goswamis have given. And, and apparently that's there. I, I can't tell you any books or anything, but Fakir Mumba has told us that that's also there in uh, Odia literature. It's something I want to research. Uh, but that's a very unique conception that we don't find. So another unique conception within our line is this statements from Vishwanath and Jiva Goswami. If, if, if we analyze them, they're very, very similar. This, this statement about how in Vrindavan there's a chamber of union and a chamber of separation. So what I'm suggesting is that here in Jagannath Puri, Srila Prabhupada, we were reading a, a comment from Prabhupada yesterday from Madhulila of Chaitanya Chaitamrita, where Prabhupada says that these three places, Vrindavan Dham, Mayapur Dham, and Jagannath Puri Dham, they're the same, they're all Vrindavan. So what does that mean? My suggestion is that, per the teachings of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and my Guru Maharaj, is that Jagannath Puri is Vipalambaketra, or the place of separation. And it's Vrindavan. Chakre Sagovardhana Brinda Katavi Kalinda Jatiri Bhuvi Swayamiyam. We had Bhagavatam that says that in Jagannath Puri you'll find the Jamuna River, the Govardhan Hill, in uh, the Vrindavan forest. In, in uh, the Purusha Bodhani Shruti, the Atarva Veda, it says that Yatha Bhagavi Jamuna Govardhana Ratna Samasana Bhimala Sadosa Chandika Sadosa Gopyaha. That the Bhagavi River is non different from the Jamuna. And Govardhan Hill is here, the Vrindavan Forest is here, the 16 gopis are here. We spoke, we quoted this verse yesterday and spoke on it a little bit. So those are all very, very difficult things to conceive. But if we understand, first of all, this is an eternal Dham. That's spoken about in Chaitanya Bhagavat. We were reading some of those verses yesterday. Krishna himself says that even after everything else is destroyed, this Dham is still present. This is a Nitya Dham, and it's, it's always present. And in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's mentioned that in the spiritual world, there's so many different planets, and so many different features of the Lord, and Puri is one of them. And Jagannath is one of the features of the Lord there. But then what is the conception of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Uh, Mahaprabhu saw this place as Vrindavan. And we were speaking a lot about that yesterday, how Lord Shiva did meditation by the, on the bank of the Bhargavi River, just coming into Puri, in the place which is now known as Chandanpur. And the Skanda Purana says that he saw Vrindavan. And Bihad Bhagavatamrita says that Gopal Kumar saw Vrindavan here. Jaiva Dharma Bhaktivinoda Thakur says several devotees were doing bhajan, they saw Vrindavan here in Puri. Chaitanya Chaitamrita describes a lab of Mahaprabhu who saw the Vrindavan forest, he saw the Jamuna River, he saw Govardhan Hill, he saw all these places here in Jagannath Puri. Uh, this is a, a, kind of, a kind of a confusing thing sometimes to devotees because we try to think in terms, in a linear, 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 linear fashion of uh, history. We see things through the, the, the eye of history or geography. And we, we try to understand, we look at a map of India. And okay, Vrindavan is there. That's in UP. It's right next to Rajasthan. Some parts of it are next to Rajasthan. And Jagannath Puri, that's in Orissa. But if you try to understand the spiritual Dham by looking at a map, you're going to have a headache. It's not going to work for you properly. Another way we try to understand it is through history, through the conception of time. And for those of you who study the Gita, we know that, that time is one of the elements spoken about in the Gita, but it's something which is only found in the material world. And that time doesn't apply exactly, at least in the same way, in the Dham. So if we go there with these preconceptions, trying to understand oh, through, through history, through geography, it's not going to work, especially if you try to understand Alita Madhav, like that. Devotees go crazy. <laughs> I, I, we speak a lot about Lalita Madhav, and I often ask devotees, as we did earlier today, how many of you have read Lalita Madhav, because I build on that. 
And then sometimes devotees start reading it. Oh, Madhavananda told me I should read Alitha Madhav. And then they come to me with real big eyes and they say, Oh my God, I was reading Alitha Madhav. And it says that, it says that Radharani jumped in the Jamuna River and committed suicide. Oh my God, well, what, what, what is that? And, and that, that Krishna ended up marrying all the gopis and they became queens and, 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 all, and you just get a huge headache. Because we're, we're trying to understand that book through history and through geography. But Rupa Goswami is saying, no, 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 don't. You should understand this through a different lens. Huh? You have some, some chashma, some glasses that we put on. These are my glasses for reading. If I open my eyes, it's going to be really blurry. Huh? We have some chashma that we, we put on to see things in a certain way. So uh, we need to, to look through the chashma, through the glasses of our previous acharya's conception. We want to understand what Rupa Goswami, and Rupa Goswami is not speaking about geography and history. Rupa Goswami is speaking about the conception of love and how that love transcends geography and history. And it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to understand because we conceive, this is just like devotees want to talk about the jiva issue. And is our sarup facts to, you know, did I fall from the spiritual world? And Bhakti Vinod says, look, he says, don't even talk about these things. He says that in, in Jaiva Dharma. He says, as long as you're a conditioned soul, you can't understand them. Because you're always going to try to understand it by the conception of time. So I, that's one reason why I don't like to argue about these subjects. They're interesting to talk about. I'm not against discussing them or practically any topic. But there's certain subjects which are not appropriate to be talked about in public with people who don't have faith in you. So I, I should stop with that. Is that okay, Leela? That's a lot of, a lot of thoughts. Do you have any other reflections or anything? Or maybe Tirtakar Prabhu? You've been quiet. I, I know you're, you, you've thought a lot about these things too. Or Jai Gore? Anybody else who's here? Or devotees here in the room? Yeah, actually, uh, I remember it in Brihad Bhagavatam, there is a, when, when Gopal Kumar is sent back by Srimati Radharani for, uh, for, for Jana Sharma Brahmana to bring him to the lotus feet of Krishna, and then he starts to realize him his own life story. And in the beginning, he actually says that I hope that Krishna will forgive me this offense to describe to you spiritual world because you are conditioned jiva and you cannot actually comprehend spiritual world but still I will do my best to do it yeah there's so many topics like this that that are interesting topics they're not bad I I don't mean to suggest these are bad topics I I I, I don't believe in, in bad topics I believe in bad attitudes but, but everything should be legal to talk about if the attitude and approaching it is, is appropriate. And uh, we can try to conceive, we can try to understand something, and we can, we can appreciate, I, I was a conditioned soul, I can't understand. But certain topics, to give another few examples, like Srila Prabhupada's Sarup, and some devotees are having this debate, some say Prabhupada's a cowherd boy, some say that Prabhupada is a gopi, and yes, my grandmas made comments about that subject, and I have a personal feeling about it. But I don't like to talk about this in public. Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, in the fourth chapter, he says some a verse that practically every new devotee knows: Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitam Idamutamam Pratyak Savagamam Dharmam Susukam Kartamavyam. So this is Raja Vidya. To understand what is Prabhupada's Swarup, it's Raja Guyam. It's the most confidential. So how do we understand it? Pratyaksa vagamam dharmyam. It should be realized. And having a debate about it, having some intellectual discussion about it, it has no meaning. It was, we were saying recently to someone else, it would be like me going online and, and giving a class about quantum mechanics. Because I went to Wikipedia today and I looked up what does quantum mechanics means. And it, quantum mechanics means that sub-molecular particles in the whole world. So I understand something about, so I, I'm going to give a lecture about that. 
But I don't know about quantum mechanics. I, I, I don't understand these subject matters. It's, it's ridiculous for me to try to speak on it. Now, I, but with friends, we can say some things. But to make a presentation formally in public, it's just wrong. Do you want to say anything else, Tirtakar Prabhu? That was a great comment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that point, what you mentioned, that if there is proper attitude and the proper atmosphere, you can discuss any topic and you will actually generate a benefit from that. But if you come there with already predetermined the idea what should be the outcome of the of the discussion, then how you can Prabhupada said you cannot wake up the person who is pretending that he's sleeping, right? Right. And, and this this is a, a problem in religious societies throughout history. You know, Christ came and, and, and he gave some beautiful teachings. And then some people said, that's really good, let's make a church. <laughs> and let's make rules. And, and, and this is what Christ's teachings are. And, and they, they, they wrote something on stone. And if you don't agree with this, then we're going to cut your head off because we're loving Christians. And, and, <laughs> and that, that's what they do. And, and we do it in our society also. You can't get away from it. And, and people mean very well. They want to protect the society. And, and I'm not... I, I'm not against even devotees doing those things, but it's difficult. Look, yesterday we were giving an example, which I think you guys have already heard, but the devotees in the room may not have heard so much. Uh, if you have a two-year-old child, now you want to raise the child, you want to tell them to be an independent thinker and don't just accept things blindly. So you can, t and the mother comes and says, don't eat bleach, don't eat laundry soap. It's poisonous. And then you tell the child, no, no, you should be an independent thinker. Think for yourself. But the child is two years old. You can't tell the child that. You just have to tell them, don't eat that. No. There's a rule. So we have to be that way with new devotees. And it's very, very important for devotees when we have these kind of discussions to understand the importance of respecting the institution that we have. The institution where we're, we're raising new people, we're training them, and that's the reality. You can't, you can't tell them to be independent thinkers yet, but we want them to be independent thinkers. Prabhupada wrote a letter to uh, Karandar Prabhu, and he said the, the purpose of the Krishna conscious movement is to create independent thinkers. We want independent thinking. Independent thinking is very important. But independent thinking has to be built upon faith in Guru, faith in Shastra. Otherwise, you just start speculating. If, if, you, if you tell a new person just to be an independent thinker, they, they have no basis of how to think independently. They're just going to think in terms of sense gratification. So, but we tell people, you be faithful to Srila Prabhupada, you hear from Guru, you hear from Shastra, and that we base everything on Shastra. And you can be an independent thinker based on Shastra. And you're trying to think, why did Srila Prabhupada say this at this time? Prabhupada gave sannyas to two devotees on the same day in Vrindavan. And the first sannyas he came to his room, Prabhupada gave him the sannyas mantra, and Prabhupada gave him an instruction. He said, a sannyasi should never stay in one place. You should travel and preach. Yes, Srila Prabhupada, he offered a basis as and left. The next new sannyasi came in and Prabhupada told him, I want you to stay here in Vrindavan and don't go anywhere. <laughs> and I want you to teach. So which instruction is correct? Both. Both. That's very important. Both are correct. And they're given to different persons at different times. Anybody else? Or Tirta Karpu, you want to you want to continue that, no? or or uh, Leela? Okay. Anybody else here in the room with anything? You can say something in Russian, and Mataji will translate. Feel comfortable. I would like to, uh, yes, to make a remark. Speak loudly so I can hear. I would like to make a remark regarding Jagannatha Puri being Vrindavan. Uh -huh. I remember Shiva Prabhupada saying uh, Vrindavan is a place where everyone loves Krishna. Explaining it in, in the way that Vrindavan is a place where everyone loves Krishna. 
Jagannath can pull it here, everyone loves Jagannath. У меня есть вопрос. У меня есть вопрос не для себя. Not for myself. По поводу я хотел спросить, что я знаю преданного, хорошего преданного, который не сентиментально, он хорошо знает шастру, он знает труды очариев, и он сталкивается с проблемой, что он видит нестыковки между тем, что говорят очарии, и между тем, что говорит Шила Прабхупада. He knows Shastra, he is not sentimental, uh, but since he studied the Acharyas, uh, he sometimes faces the problem that he finds the uh, how it's contradiction. 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 between what Shiva Prabhupada says and uh -huh. the Acharyas. So well, just wait one second. Hey, Leela, can you hear what she's saying? Can anybody hear her, her comments? Yes. I'm, if I'm really trying, I can hear. <laughs> okay, so you should speak a little louder. Okay. But, but they, they heard that so far. Okay, so he becomes confused. He has a friend who's scholarly, and he's reading different commentaries, but sometimes he becomes confused because it seems like, oh my God, that the <laughs> Samacharyas say something different from Srila Prabhupada. Okay? So what to do with that and what are you doing with that? How to deal with that? <laughs> what do, how to deal with that and what do I do with that? Well, I guess... That's my curse. We, I, we have a lot of books. We were speaking about this yesterday. Uh, first of all, we should have strong faith in Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada, he, he said that, that the, the difference between the spiritual scientists and the mundane scientists is the mundane scientists, they begin with the conception that God doesn't exist and they go about trying to prove that. But we begin with the, the opposite conception. We begin with the understanding that, that, that Krishna is real, he exists, and how can we show that? Because we're coming with authority, spiritual authority of the Gita, of our disciplic succession of Srila Prabhupada. And I found that some devotees, they don't really have a very good connection with Guru and the parampara. More, they have an intellectual conception of Krishna consciousness. They're not doing this basic principle of having faith in Guru and wanting to serve Guru. And instead, they're trying to, with their vast intelligence, <laughs> Professor Frog, right? <laughs> well, with their vast intelligence, they're trying to understand Shastra. And then they have a crisis of faith. But the crisis of faith was actually there before they read those things. Because they didn't really have faith to begin with. And they said, Prabhupada said, we didn't go to the moon. Oh my God. I, I have a stepbrother who works at NASA. <laughs> and you, you can't tell him these things. He, he's very, very vexed that we went to the moon. And they have so many pramanas and things about that. I, I really don't care. I grew up, my, my father was a science teacher. I grew up w w with, you know, people going to the moon and so many things. When I started reading this in Srila Prabhupada's books, and I'm just giving you an example of how someone might deal with this, I, I didn't do anything with it. I just read it, and I just kind of took that concept, okay, and I'm going to put that right here on the shelf. And I just put it there. And I didn't uh, say yes to it. I didn't say no to it. I just, just put it there. Prabhupada says this, this other thing, the scientists are saying this thing. And I didn't agree or disagree, but I, I'm following Srila Prabhupada. I have faith in Srila Prabhupada. Now, after some years with that particular subject about the moon, what I, because I, I have some faith in Srila Prabhupada, I made a study of what Prabhupada said. And I found an interesting thing. Whereas some devotees feel, that, and I'm just using this as an example, and I hope I don't disturb anybody. There's a disclaimer here. I'm not trying to change anybody's understanding about the moon landing, pro or con. I, I, that's not my purpose right now. I'm just using an example. 
But I found that Srila Prabhupada, some devotees say, Prabhupada said we didn't go to the moon. If you don't believe that, you're a demon. Right? But I found that Prabhupada, sometimes in his books, he says they went to the moon. And all they did was bring back rocks and dust. Or Prabhupada said that they didn't go to the moon, but maybe they went to Rahu. Prabhupada said different things at different times. And I, I, it's amazing to me that devotees get all caught up in, in like the most important thing is we didn't go to the moon. But that's not what Prabhupada was talking about. Easy journey to other planets. He speaks about that subject in uh, Higher Griva Prabhu, <laughs> Prabhupada's first editor. When he started editing that book, he saw Prabhupada said we did, they didn't go to the moon. And he said, okay, and he just cut that out. He, had, he was disturbing to him. Some devotees left ISKCON because of that, because Prabhupada said that thing. But if you look at the context, if you have faith in Prabhupada, and you look at the context of what Prabhupada's speaking about, his purpose is not talking about going to the moon. His purpose is talking about going back to Godhead. His purpose is talking about what is the purpose of the human life. And he's saying, don't, don't waste your time trying to go to different planets. Even the yogis can go to different planets. The bhakti yogi can also go to easy journey to other planets. He spoke like that. That was his point. So I, I, it's not such an essential thing for me. And similarly with our acharyas, there's, there's so many different things from our acharyas. I, 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 today we've used this example already. I'll use it again. Our two principal books about, Chait about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are Chaitanya Bhagavat and Chaitanya Charitamrita. But what do you do, and we treat them as Shastra, but what do you do if Vrindavan Das Thakur says something completely different than, than Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami? And he does. One example. He says that Sarva Bhoma Bhatta Charja, Vrindavan Das Thakur says, Sarva Bhoma Bhatta Charja was a Vaishnava before Mahaprabhu met him. And Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says he was a Mayavadi. So if someone doesn't have faith, already in our acharyas and they read it they say oh my god this is just a cult and even within krishna consciousness different people have different understandings and and how can you insist that this is correct and and it's all they don't even have their history fixed it's all nonsense and so some people might leave because of that i asked this question to fakir mohan prabhu about the difference between this conception there and other conceptions in other books, Bhakti Ritnakar, Chaitanya Mangal, and, and sometimes there's different descriptions given, historical points, sometimes big points. And he gave me such a good answer. He said the way they wrote these books was not through historical research. Remember we were talking about that today? Hmm? Rather they wrote on the basis of their Leela Spurti what they saw in their bhajan. So if you read Manavala Mamuni, he's an acharya in, in the uh, Sri Sampradaya, he'll say certain things. Vedanta Deshika is another acharya in the Sri Sampradaya. He'll say something else. If you read Viraragavacharya, he's another acharya who kind of uh, maybe in the line of Shankaracharya, and he says some other stuff that, that we don't always agree with. But sometimes maybe we do. If you read Sridhar Swami's Bhavartha Dipika commentary in the Bhagavatam, he says some things which are different from Jiva Goswami and from, from Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says some things that are different from Jiva Goswami, seemingly. So the problem is not that Jiva Goswami is saying something different from Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. That's not the problem. The problem is, we don't have proper faith. The problem is that, that we, we're, we're, our, we're, the foundation of our spiritual life is based on empiricism, on intellect, on, on gathering information. It's not based on, on faith and loving service to Gurudev. Not based on the idea that, that I'm going to receive some uh, realization, pratyaksha, pratyaksavagamam dharmyam, and I'll realize this thing. 
and we're putting so much stress on our own empirical ability to understand Shastra. That's why people have problems like this. And, and many of them are mundane scholars. And a lot of this is mundane scholars who really know the Bhagavatam. Some of them better than the devotees. They know Sanskrit, they study so many commentaries, but they don't have so much faith because they don't have a personal relationship with Guru. And he may have some other new bhakta in ISKCON, and he just, you know, he's read Ishopanishad twice, and he knows three verses from Bhagavad Gita. He doesn't know very much at all, but he has firm faith in Srila Prabhupada because of his, his, his strong connection with his guru. And that person is better than the big professor who knows so much. And we should understand that. And, and in our society, there's going to be this problem. If we keep putting stress just on information, and we put stress on Bhakti Shastra and Bhakti Vaibhava, which are good. We want devotees to study the books. But if we put so much stress on that, then as some of, the, some of my friends who are teaching Bhakti Vaibhava and Bhakti Shastra, I was teaching for some time, I quit for the same reason I'm about to express. We found there was a kind of category of professional students who were coming, and they, they weren't becoming devotees, but they knew how to pass tests, how to collect information to get good grades. But they weren't actually serving the devotees or, or really hearing in a proper way. So, like that. Huh? Yeah, as Lila Purushottam Prabhu comments here, Yesha Devi Pura Bhakti Yatha Devi Tata Guru. Thank you. So this is such an important thing. And, and honestly, this is something some of my friends in the Gaudiya Mutt, they find fault with in ISKCON. And I can understand because we're a big society and we're, we're, uh, we have a lot of rules and we depend on institutional things. Whereas if you go to some of the Gaudiya Mutts, they're more focused on a certain sadhu, guru. And, and, and honestly, that's a healthier situation. But it's not that everybody's like that. Right, in Ukraine, I see the devotees, they love Narendra Maharaj and Radnath Maharaj, and they have a strong, so many of them have a very strong connection with their guru. <clears throat> That's very, very important. Okay, Harisha? So it's a very good question, thank you. Prabhuji? Uh, may I ask... Uh, yeah, let me turn the camera around so you can see what said. Okay? <clears throat> Is a okay. Mm. Question is a follow up. Mm. You got to speak real loud. Okay. Иногда, когда преданные слышат вот эту формулировку, нужна твердая вера в Прабхупаду. Sometimes when devotees hear this statement that you have to have strong faith in Prabhupada, они боятся. So beginner devotees, uh, they they become scared. They call it uh, blind faith. How, how to help them to overcome it, and how does this? Blind faith uh, become this uh, realized faith and this strong faith. How to, how to help them also. Okay. Thank you, Guruji. Could everybody hear that? He was commenting that some people, they, they uh, have, they, they say we should have strong faith in Prabhupada. But that strong faith sometimes is fanaticism. And how do we help them to actually have developed, to have strong faith? This is, I, I see this as kind of an institutional question or a social question about our society. Of course, it's individual also. We, we, you know, how can I, I may have a relationship with, with my guru, or you may have a relationship with your friend. How can you help them to have stronger faith? But also the question applies to our society. How can we have devotee, help devotees to have stronger faith? I, I was thinking about this today. I, I was actually thinking to write an article about uh, <clears throat> I joined ISKCON, but I'm not ISKCON. That would be a, maybe a possible title. 
In other words, I'm a member of a society, but I, that's not my identity. I'm an individual within that society. And the reason this is problematic is, is it touches on your point, that there's a tendency amongst neophytes to identify themselves with their social group. I'm, I'm American. <laughs> I'm Russian. I hate all Russians. I'm Ukrainian. <laughs> I'm this, I'm that. And, and we're seeing people as their bodies. But Krishna in the Gita, he says that, that, uh, that we have to learn, again and again and again, Krishna says, we have to learn to see Sama Sarvesha Bhuteshu. We have to see everyone on an equal platform. Madbhaktam Labhate Param. Then we can come to the platform of bhakti. And there's good people in Russia, there's bad people in Russia, there's good people in America and bad people in America. There's good people in ISKCON and there's bad people <laughs> in ISKCON also. But the tendency is, amongst neophytes, is they don't have faith. They're Kamala Shraddha. But they want to have faith because they know if I don't have faith, then I'm not going to be accepted in the society. So they, they become a fanatic and they identify with certain external things. I'm a member of ISKCON and it means that, that you know you should dress like this and I like people who don't wear dhotis and saris because I'm a member of the, what is that, uh, Krishna West thing. Or I, I'm a follower of this other Maharaj in Gujarat and everybody should wear a sari and dhoti and, I, and you're not a devotee if you don't do that. And they make a big issue out of it. But actually, there's really nice devotees who wear dhotis and saris, and there's really nice devotees who don't wear dhotis and saris, and there's really lousy devotees who wear dhotis and saris, and it, it, it's such a shallow thing. So they, they, their faith is external. And they're, they're Kamala Shraddha. Their, their faith is weak. They want to have, to be accepted in the society. So we, we see amongst members of the Taliban, they want to be accepted as a member of Islam and accepted in the society. And if someone comes and writes something about Prophet Muhammad, now you know there's a controversy about Prophet Muhammad. I hope no Muslims see this video and come to kill me because of what I'm about to say. But some say that, that Muhammad was having sexual relations with a little girl. And it's, it's an historical question. So someone may be a scholar and writing about that. But amongst certain groups, if you even ask that question, they'll kill you. And that's their idea of faith in the Prophet, the faith in Muhammad. There's a bumper sticker that I once saw in America, some Christian sticker, that expresses this mood. It says, Jesus said it, I believe it, and that settles it. <laughs> There's no thing, and we can change it. Prabhupada said it, I believe it, and that settles it. But Prabhupada said different things at different times. Naturally, Naranjan Maharaj gives a beautiful example of this. He says, Guru tells you, Guru is the captain, and he tells you, turn the boat right. Yes, Gurudev. Turn the boat right. You're turning the boat right. And then Gurudev leaves. He's like, Gurudev only told me to turn the boat right. <laughs> so that's all you do. You only turn the boat right. But sometimes you need to go straight. Sometimes you need to go left. You need to understand the mood of Gurudev and not just the specific exact instruction. So when people have shallow faith, they want to be accepted by other people, they become fanatics. And they want to insist that everybody believes the way that I do. And if you don't believe this way, or if you dare to ask questions, then you're a demon, get out. We don't want you here. And, and in some ways, there's actually some truth in that, too. I, I, it would be inappropriate for me to go to the Kiev Temple on a Sunday feast program and start speaking about some of these kind of things. And some of the devotees would come to me and say, hey, Madhavananda, don't speak like that. It's, it, they're correct. We have to learn the art of speaking to people in an appropriate way according to their level of faith. But neophytes, they have this problem and they want to just insist. So how do we help them on an individual level or on a social level? We need to come more to the Madhyam platform 
And the Madhyam platform is a platform where we study Shastra. And we insist, it, as Fakir Mahabhu used to tell me sometimes, really controversial thing, he said, Madhavananda, it's not enough to quote your guru. You have to quote Shastra. I'm sorry, it's not enough to quote Srila Prabhupada. It's not enough. You should quote Shastra. What is Shastra? Because Prabhupada told us that. We should, we should quote Shastra. We should also quote Prabhupada. We should look at, but we have to look at the context of that. So that requires some maturity. Now, we want uh, devotees to come to that platform individually and collectively. How can we come to that platform? We quote this verse practically in every class. Parasparana katanam pavanam bhagavad yasa mita rata mita stustya nevita mita atmana 11.330 of the Bhagavatam that uh, describes that we should learn how to discuss with devotees. Paraspara should be some back and forth. And by that back and forth discussions about Krishna, then mito rater, mitas tustir, nevita, mita atmana, we naturally tend to give things up. Oh, I'm not going to watch television anymore. I'm going to stop smoking cigarettes. I'm going to stop this thing or that thing. Because associating with the devotees, I get inspiration. Huh? So that indicates something subtle. You can't just go into the temple and just tell everybody, everybody should do like, everybody should give up. The new people don't smoke cigarettes, don't watch television. You can't say that to them in the beginning. Why? There's a, there's a quality missing. The quality is faith. So if we want to bring devotees to a higher platform of real faith in Srila Prabhupada or in Shastra, first of all, in our discussions, they have to have faith in us. And they have to have trust in us. If we don't trust someone, if we think they have some wrong motivation or something, then, uh, that's a little easier for me, then uh, how can we, we hear from them? It's not possible. So the first thing we have to do, we have to establish a good motivation. Now, you might be able to do that in your community. You might not. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on how mature the devotees are. It depends on how many new people are, there are and how much faith people have in you. And if they don't have much faith in you, that's okay. Then you, you, you can only work with what you have. Then you have a small group of three or four devotees because you need to have communication, I guess. And then you can have some discussions and look at it from different angles. And you can say, why is it that Jiva Goswami seems to say that, that the gopis were all married and that Swakya is best, whereas Rupa Goswami and Vishnu Chakrabadi Sakwa say that Parakya is the best, that, that Krishna is, is uh, associating with non-married gopis. But Jiva Goswami says they're all married with Krishna. How do we reconcile those two things? And that's a very healthy discussion. If they have faith in you, or any other controversial topic, Lady Diksha Gurus, or, or whatever they may be. And, and, and those, I, I don't want to champion about, champion about Lady Diksha Gurus, or moon landings, or, or Swakya and Parakya. I, I want to talk about communication, and, and trust, and, and having a Vada discussion, how we can have a discussion, we trust each other. And, and it's such a valuable thing. It's such a valuable thing. And then that uh, our discussions will come to the point where we, we hear from Krishna to the holy name. But if our faith is just based on external things, just with my conception about this and my desire to be accepted in the temple and the society, and therefore I'm going to say what everybody else says, the king is wearing really nice clothes. Everybody says the king has a beautiful clothes on, but actually the king is naked. The king doesn't have anything. But because everybody else says that it's so good, then I also say that it's so good. Otherwise, they're not going to accept me. When we, we want the truth more, but we also see that if I stand up right now and I, I say the king doesn't have any clothes on, then are they going to listen to me? Maybe. Or maybe they're going to beat me and drive me out because they want to please the king. 
and maybe it's not a good idea <laughs> right now. So I have to be intelligent. We shouldn't be sentimental when we deal with Srila Prabhupada's society. That's my point. We should understand, we want to become mature devotees. We want to, have the, we want to develop uh, more Shastriya Shraddha, faith in Shastra, which is Dhridha Shraddha, which is strong faith, not Lokik Shraddha, common faith, or, or Komala Shraddha, but weak faith. But to get to that point, we have to be introspective. And if someone's just simple, and they only have faith in the Holy Name, then the Holy Name will give everything. The Holy Name will do everything, and then they'll realize, oh, I, I should be more broad-minded. If someone's really chanting Japa very, very nicely, they're so happy, and they disrespect all the ants on the ground, even the red ones that bite you. They respect all the ants on the ground and all the, the dogs that bark and all the different animals and persons and even the persons from Russia, <laughs> even the persons from America or this or that. Well, they respect and love everyone just by chanting Japa. And they'll understand that they'll have proper faith. Is that, is that helpful? There's a few comments online here, if you don't mind, let me look. Um, uh, Shamananda Krishna Prabhu's comment, how to understand devotees having different spurtis and realized platform. That's an interesting thing. Uh, there's a story which is found in the Adi Purana, and uh, which I, I think I went, came across Jiva Goswami citing it somewhere in one of the Sundarvas. It speaks about how um, Arjun, uh, was standing on the bank of the shore at, at uh, Rameshram, and he's looking out over the, over the ocean to uh, uh, Lanka, and he raised an interesting question. He said, Lord Ramachandra is such a great archer. Why didn't he just build a bridge out of arrows? What was the necessity in taking help from all these monkeys? And it just so happened there was a little monkey there. And the little monkey he said, hey, 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 don't underestimate those monkeys. They're powerful monkeys. Mm -hmm. The bridge wouldn't have been able to hold their weight. And Arjun said, look, I'm not like Ramachandra, but I could build a bridge that, that would work. Like. And, and the little monkey said, look, buddy, you couldn't build a bridge that even I could walk on. And Arjun, she's a chatri, he said, look, mm -hmm. If I can't build a bridge that, that you can walk on, then I'll jump in the fire and burn myself to death. The monkey said, okay. So then Arjun shot all these arrows, built a bridge to, to Lanka. And the monkey, little, little, little small monkey, so small, reached out one little toe and just touched the bridge and the bridge collapsed. And Arjun said, oh, let me do it again. So I made another bridge. This is an Adi Purana, the story. He made another bridge, and then the monkey stepped out on the bridge and made a few steps, and then the bridge collapsed. And then Arjun said, okay, I, I'm sorry, I made a promise. So I, and he made a fire, and he's about to jump in the fire to, to kill himself, because he made this promise. And suddenly a very beautiful young Brahmin boy showed up. And the Brahmin boy said, what are you doing? You're a Chatriya, how are you going to commit suicide? That's very bad. And Arjun said, well, this whole thing happened, and the arrows, and the bridge, and the monkey. And, this. And, and the Brahmin said, well, did you make the promise in front of a Brahmin? Because when you make a vow, you should do it in front of a, a Brahmin. And Arjun said, well, there was no Brahmins here. So he said, why don't you do it again in front of me, because I'm a Brahmin. Arjun said, okay. So he made the same promise in front of that little Brahmin boy. And again, he made a bridge out of arrows, and again, the monkey put one little foot out, and the bridge held up. And the monkey stepped out on the bridge, and the bridge didn't collapse. And the monkey started jumping up and down on the bridge, and the bridge didn't collapse. And then an amazing thing happened. Suddenly that monkey started growing very, very big. It became a huge, giant monkey, like 40 feet tall, 80 feet tall. And that monkey started stamping on the bridge, and the bridge held. And then suddenly, Hanum, <laughs> Arjun and that monkey, they turned to that Brahmin boy. And they both fell down on the ground. And Arjun said, Krishna. And he saw Krishna there. 
And that monkey, who's actually Hanuman, saw Ramachandra there. Now, they're both correct. Mm -hmm. It was Ramachandra, it was Krishna. But in Chaitanya Bhagavat, Vrindavan Nastaka says, J Rupa Chinti Dasi Se Rupa Hoy. According to the conception of the devotee, the mood of the devotee, the Lord will manifest a corresponding form. So I hope that answers your question, Shaman and the Krishna. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, and Jai Gora Prabhu is commenting, would you say, regardless of people's different natures, that everyone in ISKCON should commit to being as studious as possible? On the other side, perhaps if we think that studying Shastra intensely is not in our nature, maybe one might use that as a crutch or hide behind that nature in order to avoid approaching Shastra more seriously. Can you understand it? I'm just going to give a second to translate that. Jai Gore, you're losing weight like anything, man. You're going to have to start eating more, you know. So, you, this is something you've also heard me speak about before. If we say that it's necessary to study Shastra, and without studying Shastra you can't understand Bhakti, then you cannot say that bhakti is independent. But in Madhurya Kadambani, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur establishes that bhakti is swarat, bhakti is independent. Bhakti is not dependent on Shastra. And therefore someone may be blind, maybe they can't read. Gorki Shodas Babaji, he read Bengali, but he couldn't read Sanskrit. But he's a great devotee, he wasn't reading the Bhagavatam, but he's a great devotee. So it's not required for that. So what is required is that we serve. And I can tell you, over the years growing up in Los Angeles, I, I joined in 1982, I have many friends who are Prabhupada disciples. And I love them. And I, the, why do I love them? Because they helped establish this movement. They did so much. But some of them, a lot of them, sometimes very honestly, really don't understand Shastra very much. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Some of them honestly don't even understand Prabhupada's books so much. Some of them. Sometimes. Huh? Because they were too busy. They were too busy going out doing book distribution. They were too busy going out and doing Harinam and, and working for Srila Prabhupada. And they didn't have time sitting around and just reading books all day long. Prabhupada wanted that. But in the early days, many devotees, they weren't reading so much. Jayananda Prabhu, <laughs> he, he, did, he wasn't a big Shastrik pundit, but he was an exalted devotee. Prabhupada said he was a pure devotee. Jamuna, I, I, as far as I understand, she wasn't a big reader, but, or such a knowledgeable person, that we, but she loved Prabhupada, and she gave everything to Prabhupada. And that's the main qualification. So we read, we study Shastra only for the purpose of serving Guru. Otherwise, what's the point of it? If you read so many books, you just become proud. And therefore, in, in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam, in Chaitanya Sikshamrita, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and Jaiva Dharma, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, some of the writings of Baladi Vidya Bhushan, I, I've read again and again where Vaishnavas are saying that, that you should not read too many books. There's a danger in reading too many books because you just become proud. It's not necessary. If you only read Bhagavad Gita, that's all that's required. Nothing else, just only Bhagavad Gita. You can get everything just from Bhagavad Gita. But at the same time, someone may do some service for their guru. We're trying to do some service here. But that service is relative. It's relative in the sense that here we're studying books and we're translating things. And sometimes people come and they clap their hands and they say, oh, that person is so advanced and this and that. But we're nowhere near as advanced as Jayananda Prabhu. I don't think we'll ever become as advanced as Jayananda Prabhu. He loved Prabhupada and he gave everything to Prabhupada. And we should always and necessarily remember that. It's so important. But we, we, we have these book things because my grandmas wanted that. But that's the only reason. Otherwise, I'm useless. I don't know anything. I'm just a fool. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, 
He said, Mora Gurudev, my, my Gurudev told me, Murkatumi, Tomara Vedanta Nahika Adhikar. He said, my, my Gurudev told me, you're a fool. You don't have qualification for Vedanta Sutra. Mahaprabhu said that. And he said, I only know one verse. Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam. It doesn't say Shastra Swadhyaya, Shastra Swadhyaya, Shastra Swadhyaya, Eva Kevalam. Just by reading, by reading, by reading, but just by, by hearing, uh, by taking shelter of the holy name. Right? Lila Prashotam has made a nice point. He's citing a, a beautiful verse from Chaitanya Chaitamrita, not only chapter 2, Siddhanta Bhuliya Chitte Kodiya Nakoro Alas. That we shouldn't be Nakoro Alas, we shouldn't be lazy. We should try to understand Siddhanta. But that doesn't, and we should read. But Srila Prabhupada didn't just say that we just read like we do. I, 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 I studied literature a little bit before I was a devotee. My mother was a librarian. I always grew up around books. Uh, and I remember we, had, uh, we were studying um, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And it's a famous British writer, famous book, Brave New World. And so you may write an essay on Brave New World. You may say, I've mastered Brave New World. And maybe you've memorized the whole book. But you can't master Bhagavad Gita. Because Bhagavad Gita is Krishna. And Bhagavad Gita is always going to present something a little different sometimes. Bhagavatam is Krishna. Krishna tuya Bhagavata Bibhu Sarvashray Prati Shloki Prati Akshana Nata Koi. So we should... Uh, discuss things, we should think about things. It's very, very important. But that thinking is not dependent upon how much we read. When Srila Prabhupada said he wanted devotees to read, I was reading something recently by some non-devotees, and they were commenting that, that uh, one thing that Bill Gates, uh, this other guy who has those electric cars, I can't remember his name, very famous billionaire in this world today. What's his name? Elon Musk. Elon Musk, right, it's exactly it. Elon Musk, what are Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Benjamin Franklin, and he mentioned a few, other, a few other people, what do they all have in common? And they said they would spend one hour a day just thinking about things. Maybe, maybe reading some book, trying to learn something, but looking at it from different perspectives. And this is a mundane example, but this is what Srila Prabhupada wanted us to do with the books not just read it and memorize verses that we can mechanically repeat, but, but to uh, analyze it and, and see it from different perspectives. Okay? Lila, you want to make some of the comment on that? It's just a question uh, because that's uh, like satisfying uh, reconciliation. So would that alas, this laziness, uh, could be it, uh, presented just uh, like what was the original seed of that that, that uh, discussion uh, of that uh, devotee present there in, in the room, uh, seeing as a like blind faith. You know, you just read something, no matter what amount you read, but you just don't don't uh, contemplate it, don't don't discuss it with other devotees, don't. And in that way, you could be, alas, you could be lazy in understanding Siddhanta. Exactly. Beautifully put. Thank you. It's such an important thing. And sometimes we see devotees. <laughs> I remember, I'm going to say something negative about Vaishnava that I, I appreciate very much. Radhanath Maharaj, please forgive me. But, but I'm, going to, I'm going to heal our, our wounds as we go along. I, I once saw online someone criticizing Radhanath Maharaj. And what was your criticism? Why does he tell so many stories? Prabhupada didn't tell so many stories. Why does he give class for so long? Prabhupada only gave class for half an hour. He's speaking for four hours or six hours. Prabhupada didn't do like that. <laughs> so <laughs> this is no koro alas. This is alas. This is being lazy in the mind. That we just take what Bhaktisiddhanta called a lexicographical or dictionary understanding of Prabhupada of a situation and that, that we just analyze how long Prabhupada spoke for, <laughs> for 30 minutes and Prabhupada would, would, he, he would quote a few verses, he would do like this and this, and if you do something different we don't, we don't accept that. And then we should not be lazy, we should think. 
You know, so so someone may be quoting Shastra and reading books, but they, that may be their laziness. Okay? Anybody else who thinks it's really late here, we're going to have to take rest pretty soon. But uh, I want to uh, just see. Jai Gore, are you okay? Okay, nice to see you, Prabhuji. And what about Radha Jeevan Prabhu? You look really handsome in your picture there, Prabhu. I really like it. He has a picture of a cow. Any, any comments from Radha Jeevan Prabhu? Haribo Prabhu Ji, nice uh, to I don't have anything specific, but I'm just appreciating the discussion that's come forward. Okay, thank you Prabhu. I don't want to keep everybody so long. This is Prabhu. Natalia, anything that you want to share? You okay? You got to hear some nice, sweet Russian today. Natalia lives in Estonia. And she, she mostly speaks Russian, so she's probably very happy. And she's not saying anything. She may be with her kids or something. She can't really talk. Anything, you know. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and stop there. Let me look on the calendar real quick here. Um, next week. Uh, next week, we should have our normal session. And, I, and I'd like to try to go... Either we can begin praying Bhakti Chandrika, or if, if devotees want, and I'm speaking now for the devotees in our Pari Prashna group, uh, we can uh, go over some things again with, with questions you might have from the Mangala Charna. But I think I pretty much finished the Mangala Charna Kata in our last session. And uh, I, I want to go on to praying Bhakti Chandrika, which is a whole thing for me. I'm not used to speaking on that. And we'll, we'll begin studying that wonderful book together. Okay? Okay, so I want to thank also all the devotees here in the room who are present with us today, taking part in things. It was a little different. Srila Prabhupada Ki, Samabeda Bhakta Bhakta Ki, Goprim Anandi Hari Hari Bol, Vancha Kalpa Dadu Bishcha, Kripa Sindhu Bhikacha, Patita Nampa Vanibhyo, Vaishnavibhyo Namona Maha, Anandakodi Vaishnavindhikicha.